Good evening guys, how are you doing and how's your preparation going? So guys, a very warm welcome to this e-lecture. Today we are going to be discussing a very important subject area in law that is Indian Penal Code. Now, as whether it's CLAT or it's the All India Law Entrance Test which is conducted by NLU Delhi or it's the Symbiosis Law Entrance Test, IPC as a subject holds a lot of value and I'm sure all of those who have been attempting mocks and gone through the previous actual uh, papers, they must have noticed the relevance of this section. So the main idea that's going to remain in today's e-lecture is that we are going to try to breeze through the most important aspects of IP the most important topics as well as subtopics. Now we have to cover the important points in the next 90 minutes. So the idea is that I am going to give you a specific time after say 15 or 20 minutes to post your queries. We don't break the flow of this lecture and at the same time I can also attend to your queries. Is that okay? All right. Great. So we are going to start our discussion on Indian Penal Code. Now let me give you a brief introduction on what IPC is all about. It is of course a separate legal uh, subject and holds a lot of relevance. It does two very basic and important things for us. First of all, it defines what a crime is and it also defines what is going to be its punishment. So this is the most basic and the most general definition that you can come up with as far as IPC is concerned, that is Indian Penal Code. Now this act was created in the year 1860 and it was created by the First Law Commission under the chairmanship of Lord Macaulay. Let's proceed with this session. Now what are going to be our focus areas for the next 90 minutes? I'll be discussing general exceptions under the Indian Penal Code with you. I will be be discussing offenses against human life, offenses against human body followed by offenses against human property. Let's get some basic concepts clarified at the very onset of this session. Now since the whole purpose or objective of the Indian Penal Code is to punish an offender or punish a wrongdoer, then we have to follow a certain benchmark or principle when we are deciding how the punishment is going to be given or if at all the punishment has to be given. So you can see this maxim on your screen, actus non facet, rum nisi mensit rea, which means that a physical act alone is not enough to uh, hold a person guilty, it should be accompanied by a wrong intention or a malified intention. That is why we've broken this maxim into these two keywords, actus reus, which means your physical act or omission, and mens rea, which means a guilty mind. Now, when both these ingredients coexist, only then you can hold a person punishable or liable for an offense as far as the Indian legal system is concerned. Now, we know that physical act has to concur with your mental element. But the next question is how relevant is motive as far as punishment is concerned? Now, your ultimate motive behind doing an act may be noble or may be very, very moral. Say, for example, you might steal a medicine or you might steal food to save an ailing mother or to save a starving sibling. But the law does not consider motive. The law is only looking at your intention and your intention is to steal. So what is going to happen in most of the law entrances when you're going to get a principal fact question, you are going to be put in this dilemma or you're going to be put in the spot where you have to choose between motive and intention. And mostly as laymen, we are going to uh, go with an option which says that since the motive was noble, the person should not be punished. So students be very careful. Do not give an offender or do not give given accused the benefit of a moral motive. The next point on your slide is prosecution and defense counsel. Now you need to clarify these two basic terms because we, uh, you will be reading these terms very often uh, in IPC. Prosecution is the party which is involved in uh, punishing an offender or an accused. So the ultimate motive is to uh, ensure that the person who was wronged or the victim gets his justice and of course defense is that counsel or defense is that party which has to defend itself against the charges that have been put on it. Now the next point on the slide is burden of proof. 
Now, what do you understand by burden of proof? Burden of proof is the responsibility of proving the guilt. Now, who does this responsibility lie on? The responsibility lies on the prosecution. They have to ensure that they prove that the person who has been accused his offence is proven. All right. Because the last point on the slide tells you very clearly that the law assumes an individual to be innocent until and unless you prove his guilt beyond reasonable doubt. So if you fail to prove the guilt of an offender uh, under that scale of reasonable doubt, then the law is going to let him go or acquit him. All right. Let's move further. General exceptions. Now the first focus area that uh, holds a lot of relevance and you can expect a whole lot of principal fact questions from the except general exceptions area. Now, uh, let me clarify at the very onset that the section numbers don't hold any relevance. You're not going to be asked a direct question on which section defines a certain offense or which section defines rape or which section defines murder, etc, etc. You need to have extreme conceptual clarity about the definitions of all these offenses because ultimately when you'll be given a factual situation, you need to decide whether a certain act amounts to theft or not or rape or not or murder. Now, General exceptions, what are general exceptions all about? Gen exceptions is the very word you know is when you deviate from the normal rule. Okay, you must have heard this line that there are always exceptions. So similarly, even under IPC, we have exceptions. Now, these are scenarios where if uh, a person is accused of having committed a crime, he accepts that he committed that physical act, but his mental element was lacking that means he did not have a malified intention or a criminal intention and i've already clarified it to you that a physical act alone is not enough to make a person guilty under ipc so under general exceptions you prove certain circumstances along with the fact that there was a lack of criminal intention and thereby you escape liability completely the first point on this slide says the burden of proof shifts right Burden of proof shifts means that I told you in the previous slide that usually the burden of proof is on the prosecution counsel. The person who's putting the claim usually has the responsibility to prove the guilt. But here, the burden of proof shifts on to the other side. The person who is accused is going to say that no doubt I've committed the offense, but the point is that the criminal intention was lacking. Like the slide says, actus reus exists, which means the physical act is there, but mens rea, that means a malified intention or a guilty mind is missing. Now, what are the general exceptions that we are going to be covering? We will be covering accident, act done to avoid other harm, act of child, act of an insane person, act of an intoxicated person, bona fide act for another's benefit and communication made in good faith, act done under compulsion or threat and private defense. Okay, so we are going to start with the first general exception that is accident. All right. So accident is that situation where uh, an act takes place or an event takes place due to misfortune as the slide tells you and the person who commits that accident does not have any criminal intent or knowledge. He is doing something which is completely lawful. He is doing it in a lawful manner and he is using lawful means and he is taking all care and caution. So say for example if a wrestling match is going on and the two wrestlers, you know wrestling is not a banned game. It is a legal sport in India and if two wrestlers in a wrestling bout exchange blows, they are following the required care and caution they're following all the rules despite of that if one wrestler ends up injuring another wrestler it's going to be a case of accident and it is going to be a complete defense that even though the physical act of injury is there but he did not have the criminal intent to injure the other wrestler i'm moving on to the next exception now that is act done to avoid other harm or an act done to avoid a bigger harm now this is a scenario where you choose between two wrongs Okay, you do know that the act you're about to commit is wrong, but ultimately you're looking at the bigger picture and the bigger picture is that you're going to commit that smaller wrong to avoid a bigger wrong. All right, let's take a look at this slide. It says absence of criminal intention or knowledge again and you are doing 
this small or wrong in good faith now you have the knowledge that it is likely going to cause harm but ultimately like i said your objective is to avoid a bigger hazard let's take a look at this example a huge fire engulfs a row of huts a passer by pulls down the houses to prevent the fire from spreading now if you look at the conduct of a in isolation the act of pulling down those houses is wrong in itself but if you look at the bigger picture he is trying to break that chain otherwise the fire is going to spread and it is going to lead it's going to lead to a bigger damage so this is how an individual can successfully end up taking the defense or exception of act done to avoid other harm let's move on to the next exception act of child now act of child is a very very important exception and it is based on the maxim as the first point you see on your screen which is dolai incapax now dolai incapax means that some category of individuals are considered to be incapable of having a criminal intention especially for want of age in general terms it means that children are incapable of having a criminal intention but the law has divided children into several age groups when we talk about the criminal responsibility let's look at the first age group a child who is below 7 years irrespective of his intentions or irrespective of going into his criminal intent or his knowledge maturity or understanding he will never be convicted or he will never be punished if you look at the next category 7 to 12 it will depend on the maturity and understanding of a child so if a 10 year old child threatens another individual with a knife and he says i am going to cut you down to pieces or i am going to kill you that means he has that sufficient maturity or understanding that if he inflicts a wound on another person with a knife what are going to be the implication so in that case the 10 year old child is going to be criminally liable or responsible okay between as far as the age group of 12 to 18 is concerned so we have the juvenile justice act of 2015 okay any child who falls between the age group of 12 to 18 and if he commits a crime he is going to be tried under the juvenile justice act of 2015 a juvenile means an individual who is in conflict with law and juveniles are not sent to jails they are sent to correction homes but uh, after the nirbhaya rape incident and when one of the convicts was a juvenile that is he was below 18 there was this nationwide demand that somebody who is below 18 and who commits such a heinous crime should not be given the benefit of being tried under the juvenile justice act so the juvenile justice act was amended in 2015 and as per the new act any child who is above the age of 16 if he commits a heinous crime like rape or murder then he will be tried and prosecuted as per the indian penal code so considering these recent changes you can expect a question this year under the category of act of child all right okay our next category or our next exception is act of an insane person now an insane person again is someone who is incapable of thinking straight right so we can't be very sure about the fact whether he can form a clear criminal intent or not now owing to the unsoundness of mind there are two things that an individual who is claiming insanity as a defense should not know the first thing that the person should not know is the nature of the act say for example an insane person picks up a knife and stabs another individual now here he does not understand that the act of picking up a sharp knife and then stabbing another individual with it is inherently dangerous so first point is taken care of right that he does not understand that the act is dangerous the second point he does not understand is that it is also contrary to law okay so two things you have to prove first you don't understand that the act is inherently in dangerous and also it is contrary to law so stabbing another person is also under the category of grievous hurt okay so that is again not allowed by the law of this country see everything that is dangerous is not going to be illegal adventure sport like bungee jumping it is dangerous but it's not illegal so both the points have to concur or coexist right the act also has to be inherently dangerous and it has to be 
contrary to law but this is something that the insane person does not know or does not have knowledge of i've quoted act of an into intoxicated person at the bottom of this slide because the ingredients remain the same when a child when an individual is intoxicated again he is incapable of understanding the nature of the act whether it's dangerous or not and also he is incapable of understanding whether it's contrary to law or not so again act of an insane person and act of an intoxicated intoxicated person uh, put an individual in an cat in a category where they cannot think straight the only additional point please note the only additional point you have to be very careful about when you're dealing with situations where an intoxicated person is involved that the intoxication has to be involuntary that means without his will or out of his will without his consent if a person got intoxicated voluntarily then he will not be able to take the defense of act of an intoxicated person okay bona fide act for another's benefit is a next exceptions all right i have a small request to make i'm going to pause in the next 5 minutes and then i'm going to take up all your queries up until this point all right so just hold on till then let me finish our first key area that is general exceptions is that all right pankaj definition of will i would say kuch apni marzi se karna doing something out of your choice okay so if you are getting drunk or if you are taking if you are consuming a certain drug out of your own will then you cannot take up the defense of being intoxicated we are talking about involuntary intoxication clear okay let's move on bona fide act for another's benefit now sometimes you might end up undertaking an act or you might end up executing an act for the benefit of another person let's take a look at this slide you do this act in complete good faith and sometimes you may be doing this act which you are doing for the benefit of another person without the consent of that person okay now i'm going to give you an example rescue cases come under this category right so of course when you are rescuing someone the situation is dangerous right and there may be a situation where you cannot take the consent of the person you are rescuing and there can also be a situation that the person you are rescuing is incapable of giving a a consent for himself but you still rescue that person in good faith because you know that if you don't bail out that person from that dangerous situation then he will end up harming himself all right so let's take an illustration here the example says a is in a house which is on fire with a child people below hold out a blanket a drops the child from the house top knowing that it is likely that the fall may kill the child but not intending to kill the child so here a key point is he does not intend to kill the child but his only option is to throw the child out of the window of a house which is on fire right and here he cannot take of course the consent of the child who is under danger and he cannot get in touch with his parents or guardian so all the ingredients that were mentioned on the previous slide are fitting into this situation all right so here even if the child is killed by the fall as the slide says a in this case has committed no offense all right let's move on to a next exception when you make a communication in good faith now see human beings are social animals we communicate with each other we talk to each other some communications make us happy some conversations make us happy and other conversations might uh, make us sad and some uh, communications or some conversations are, are of such a serious and sensitive nature that they can have even a physical impact on us so here we are talking about the communications that people in the police have to make people in the army have to make doctors have to make where they have to disclose certain unpleasant things to other individuals now say for example a police officer who has to disclose to a mother that his son has been injured severely on the highway or if an army man has to disclose to the family of a fellow army man that you know a son or a father or a brother has been missing on the border so all these communications are of extremely sensitive nature so but what you have to keep in mind is that practical jokes are not included in this category the communication that you make a has to be made in good faith b it has to be genuine information it has to be a uh, truthful information all right and the communication should be of such a nature that if you do not communicate it then the other person on the receiving end might be at a 
लॉस द नेक्स्ट एक्सेप्शन इज एक्ट डन अंडर थ्रेट ऑफ कंपल्शन ओके सो देर आर समाइम्स वेर यू डू नॉट वॉन्ट टू डू अर्टन एक्ट बट इफ अनादर इंडिविजुअल थ्रेट इन यू ओके a person might say that i am going to kill you if you do not do a certain thing all right then you might undertake an act say for example a person threatens you and says i am going to kill you if you don't go and steal a certain amount of money from the bank now here you have to save your life so you are acting under threat or compulsion let's see what the ingredients of this exception say when a person is compelled to do an act under threat so threat happens to be a key ingredient here and the person who is under the threat he must have this fear or apprehension that in case he will not perform this act the result may be instant death now the only exception please be very very careful about the last point there are two things you cannot do or you must not do even when your own life is under threat that is you're not supposed to kill another person and the second thing that you're not supposed to do is you're not going to commit any act against the state okay you're not going to commit any act against the country you're not supposed to leak sensitive information you're not supposed to indulge in the trade of counterfeit currency or you're not supposed to encourage sedition that is desh dro which has been in news uh thanks to the incidents that took place at JNU and DU so these incidents brought out a very sensitive topic recently that is of sedition and also how it has been contradicting with your freedom of speech and expression so there are two things students that a person is not allowed to do even if his own life is under threat that is murder or to cause an offense against the state okay right of private defense is a final exception now uh, we are all born with this instinct to save ourselves as you can see the very first point on the slide talks about the doctrine of self preservation whether it's human beings or the tiniest of animals like an ant everybody has been born with this inherent instinct to save ourselves so you must have heard numerous instances of how people sometimes even amaze themselves when it comes to situations where they have to save their lives okay people uh, end up doing things they had never thought they would do because ultimately we all want to survive we all want to live now you have this defense available for two things first you are allowed to protect your body your life and secondly you are allowed to protect your property so person and property these are the two things to which your right of private defense exists now there are certain rules okay that you have to keep in mind when we talk about the right of private defense okay first of all the word we are using here is defense so defense is always a response to an attack so you should never never be taking the first step right if you are under attack only then you are going to exercise your right of private defense then the second point they are talking here is that it has to be proportional to the attack so say for example somebody is running towards you he does not have any weapon in his hand he is completely unarmed and at the most he might uh, you know give you some blows with his fist okay and you have a gun with you and in response you shoot the person now you have exceeded your right of private defense you made a disproportionate use of your right of private defense so every any individual who is under threat or attack should make sure that uh they use only proportionate force because the ultimate objective of private defense is not to let an individual take the law into his hands the objective is to make sure that the person who is under attack at that point should be able to get out of the situation okay with the least amount of injury or the least amount of loss now attack and defense have to happen simultaneously that means when you are under threat at that very minute you should respond with your defense say for example somebody was about to attack you in the morning but he or she could not successfully complete the attack and in the evening you decide to go and attack the person now this has not happened simultaneously a lot of time has lapsed in between and you had enough time to take the help of the police or any other third person right instead of taking the law into your own hands so the point is that the two have to happen simultaneously 
and like i just mentioned that you exercise this right only where you have no other option but to help yourselves if you had the time to approach the police authorities or any other authorities who are involved in law and order then you will not be allowed to exercise this right of private defense all right so we're done with our first focus area that is general exceptions please bring in your queries okay anuj you were saying that when a girl is taken out of the custody of a lawful guardian what would be the defense for a if he is charged with under kidnapping of a girl under 18 years of age see uh, ultimately anuj we have to keep the factor of motive in mind right and uh, we know that any girl who's below the age of, age of 18 years she cannot go away without the consent of her parents or guardians all right so for the purpose of attempting the question this question has been discussed even in the classroom sessions if we have to pick up the best option here like i've told you there are scenarios where they may not be the correct option but there may be a situation of coming up with the best option so in this situation for the sake of answering of course the best defense would be that he thought that the girl is above the age of 18 but legally that's not a sound proposition is an act done under threat except murder no shivanshi all these general uh, exceptions that we've discussed till now they are complete defenses that means you will escape punishment completely there will be zero liability or zero punishment the only thing you have to prove is that there was no criminal intention because i told you physical act and criminal intention have to coexist only then you can be punished and in all these general exceptions that we've discussed in the last half an hour the one common thread that has been running through is a lack of criminal intention right of private defense is available to save only your property but the recent court judgments have reflected that right of private defense is also exercised when somebody near and dear to you especially family members their lives are under threat so courts have given people the benefit of exercising right of private defense even in that situation pankaj uh sahil uh, there are 511 sections under ipc but uh, i mentioned even in the beginning that you do not need to remember any sections as far as ipc is concerned you need to have factual clarity about the uh, definitions of offenses okay you don't even need to know the punishment you just need to be conceptually clear about the definition as to what ingredients have to be there no aditya the section numbers are not important at all no shraddha it would not be right to kill another person if you are under threat because i said you can do anything when your life is under threat but you cannot take another person's life okay shada and you also cannot uh, commit any act against the state you know the juvenile justice act uh, has been amended in 2015 and the most important thing that you have to remember is that earlier uh, see the only uh, loophole that was there in the previous juvenile justice act was that uh, anyone who fell within the age group of 12 and 18 no matter what they did the maximum punishment they would get is 3 years in a correction home but after the nirbhaya rape incident where one of the convicts was someone who was below the age of 18 an amendment or change was made in the law and now it said that if there is a child who is above 16 and if he commits rape or murder or any other heinous crime then the trial will take place under ipc so this is the key point you should remember who's liable for intoxication see uh, aditya intoxication if it was involuntary if, if it was without your consent if you had no idea uh, then only you are going to get the benefit of being intoxicated otherwise you will not be able to claim the benefit of intoxication because ultimately uh, an accused has to prove all these points because he wants to escape liability he wants to escape punishment uh, sahil of late clad has completely given up the trend of asking section numbers okay so don't worry about it even if it's that's going to be the case it's going to be one odd question like i told you sedition has been in news so section 124a deals with sedition and murder 
और कल्पेबल होमोसाइड नॉट अमाउंटिंग टू मर्डर कल्पेबल होमोसाइड नॉट अमाउंटिंग टू मर्डर सेक्शन टू नाइन नाइन विल बी डिस्कस विल बी डिस्कसिंग इट फर्दर इन दिस वेरी सेक्शन सो डोंट वरी अबाउट इट इट्स गोइंग बी वन वन आउट क्वेश्चन एंड फॉर वन आउट क्वेश्चन आई वुड नॉट रिकमेंड यू टू लर्न फाइव हंड्रेड एंड इलेवन सेक्शन ऑल राइट सुरबी दैट्स अ गुड क्वेश्चन बिकॉज दैट वॉज एग्जैक्टली द केस दैट हैपन्ड इन द सलमान खान हिट एंड रन केस सो ही इट वॉज अ केस ऑफ ड्रंक एंड ड्राइविंग राइट बट सलमान खान वॉज नॉट गिव इन दिस डिफेंस बिकॉज इज इन टॉक्सिकेट was voluntary and when your friends force you to have a drink that does not come under involuntary intoxication it again comes under voluntary intoxication pankaj uh, you should definitely learn legal maxims we have uh, a set of 100 questions on our student dashboard and these 100 questions have been divided into 5 parts that is every test has 20 questions so we've tried to deal with the most important maxims all right harris let me read your query if a person already has an intention to commit an offense however he gets involuntarily intoxicated before committing the crime and then commits the offense is the person liable harris that's a really good question because when we are trying to see whether criminal intention existed or not we look at three things the behavior of an individual before the act during the act and after the act so your problem says if before the act he had that intention of committing a crime then in this case he is going to be liable all right yes zinat involuntary intoxication would include uh, when your drinks or your food are spiked by synthetic drugs okay because when it's alcohol it's very difficult to plead this defense honestly practically speaking if you will see cases that are fought in the courts then this is a very difficult uh, defense to prove but as far as the synthetic drugs or chemical drugs are concerned which do not even change the smell taste or look of your food or drink if that is administered to you then you can very well plead this defense yes sir be it is still going to be a crime because there is a, only a certain amount of alcohol which is allowed to be in your body when you drive which is very very minimal okay if you are driving with that amount of alcohol in your body and if you are driving with a seat belt on if you are driving within the speed limit and you have a valid driving license then you come within the category of accident because you are doing something that is lawful in a lawful manner by undertaking all care and caution clear yeah? so if you've had just the amount of alcohol which you are allowed to have when you drink and drive then you will be able to get the benefit of accident uh yes amandeep because uh if see amandeep let me tell you a situation a person might be approaching you with a gun okay now you don't know whether it's loaded or it's unloaded but you are going to obviously sh- shoot back in response because you're not going to ask the attacker that listen is your gun loaded or not right so the point is if someone shooting at you you can't really be sure that he's going to just shoot at your leg and he's not going to shoot you further so you're definitely allowed to shoot back in private defense uh, okay surbhi but if it was the man's intention to commit suicide i'm telling you surbhi you will get the uh, benefit of accident i've told you that if you have just the right amount of alcohol because ek prescribed limit hota hai jitna alcohol aapki body mein ho sakta hai at the time when you're driving agar utni hi prescribed limit mein alcohol hai then you can get the benefit of accident all right now i'm moving on to the next key area All right so if you still have some queries uh, from this focus area we'll take that up towards the end a next uh, key area is offenses against human life i've told you in the very beginning of the session that ultimately what is the objective of indian penal code it is going to define crimes for you and it's going to tell you what is going to be the punishment for that crime the first category that we are going to deal with is the most heinous crime that is offense against the human life now for that we need clarity on a few terms the word that we use is homicide okay homicide means when one human being kills another human being now see the next point is saying that homicide can be lawful or it can be unlawful lawful homicide would mean when a court awards death punishment okay that is the legal killing of one human being by another human being or you heard about mercy killing passive euthanasia are you aware about the term passive euthanasia mercy killing okay so passive euthanasia is again a, an example of lawful homicide so for all those who don't know people who are extremely ill 
okay or people who are in a vegetative state who have been in a coma sorry who been in a coma for many many years whose uh, existence is uh, not as fulfilling so very recently in the case of aruna shanbagh the supreme court has allowed euthanasia that is uh, mercy killing passive euthanasia we are going to take that up uh, in detail in another session when we'll be dealing with fundamental rights and unlawful homicide would mean a murder now what are the types of unlawful homicides in india the first is murder okay so we are going to discuss murder then what is culpable homicide not amounting to murder this term again became really popular after the salman khan hit and run case because the the charges of culpable homicide not amounting to murder were pressed pressed against him now causing death by rash and negligent act is another type of homicide and finally we have attempt to commit suicide now these are the four types of unlawful homicides that take place now causing death by rash and negligent act rash and negligent act means negligent means when you're caref- careless and rash is when you have this complete disregard for rules and regulations so say for example you run over someone while you were over speeding that is causing death by a rash and negligent act Section three zero four A covers causing death by rash and negligent act. You may learn this section number and attempt to commit suicide. Please understand one thing: that attempt to commit suicide at one point was a crime under the IPC, but now it has been decriminalized. Earlier, if an individual attempted a suicide, he used to be put in jail. okay but now if a person commits suicide attempts to commit suicide then he is sent for psychiatric help so this is something that the country still does not allow you are not allowed to take away your life but now the uh, the process that follows after this that has changed that means you are not going to be sent to jail instead you are going to be offered psychiatric help which is exactly a person who has tried to end end his life would need now i'm going to primarily focus on murder and culpable homicide not amounting to murder now students remember one thing that in cat they're not going to ask you for definitions they're not going to ask you for section numbers they're looking for conceptual clarity as far as murder and culpable homicide not amounting to murder uh yes pankaj just hold your query as far as uh cat is concerned or any other law entrance is concerned they are going to test you on the knowledge whether you know whether a certain death should be called murder or it should be called culpable homicide not amounting to murder now let's proceed and try to understand that in a situation where a person dies are we supposed to call it murder or are we supposed to put it under the category of culpable homicide not amounting to murder all right so we are going to pick up one illustration we are going to twist it around a little bit and then we are going to see how a small change in certain circumstances might put a death in the category of murder or culpable homicide not amounting to murder all right look at this illustration on the screen a gives b a blow on his stomach a knows that b has an ulcer knows in his stomach and even a minor blow will cause the ulcer to burst resulting in b's death okay now a will be liable for b's murder now this is a situation where a simply gives a blow in the stomach of b but a knows that he has a ulcer in his stomach and even a small punch in the stomach is going to cause the ulcer to burst and the poison will spread and eventually b will die right so it is going to be classified under the category of murder now let's spin the situation a little bit and see how the same situation might amount to culpable homicide not amounting to murder yes hena absolutely right it's murder culpable homicide not amounting to murder now a gives b a blow in his stomach a has no knowledge okay a has no knowledge about b having an ulcer in the stomach and that a minor blow will also prove fatal now you see b's situation remains the same he has an ulcer in his stomach what has changed is in both the situations in one situation a knew that a has an ulcer in his stomach in the next situation a was not aware about it okay now in this case a will be liable for culpable homicide not amounting to murder okay is this illustration clear because i am going to proceed further and i am going to give you some more clarity on how you categorize death as murder or culpable homicide not amounting to murder yes pankaj you were saying something about article 
all right pankaj i'm going to wait for you to complete your question till then i'm going to move forward okay so when do you classify death as murder okay so when the probability of death is more than survival okay so focus on this the illustration that we just discussed was a knew that b has a ulcer in his stomach and even if he is going to give him one punch in the stomach b is going to die most likely right so the probability of death is much more correct what was the kind of weapon used sharp weapon or a gun now let me clarify something to you whenever we are trying to classify a death as murder or culpable homicide not amounting to murder i would suggest do not blindly classify an act uh, done with an intention to commit murder now if i am using say for example a sword okay or a sharp edge knife and i inflict a small wound on somebody's leg now knife does not always mean that i want to kill the person i have inflicted a small wound on the person's leg it may not prove fatal then the second situation is i might have a gun but i might shoot the person you know in his arm or in his leg again my intention is not to kill however i might just have a stick but i might attack someone on his vital organs his head or you know our vital organs is this entire area from my head till our stomach so everything inside is uh, made up of our vital organs so if i uh, target these vital organs with a blunt stick or a blunt bat then that does not mean i did not have the intention to kill so you must always view this in combination the kind of weapon that is being used and the body part that is being targeted okay now uh, injury on the vital part of the body like i've just mentioned now the slide says naturally the injury is sufficient to cause the death and offender has the knowledge that his act is imminently dangerous and in all probability death is bound to occur now when you uh, commit such an act you know whose result is going to be immediate death or death will take place in the natural course of events then your act will be classified as murder no uh, uh, dj a uh, culpable homicide not amounting to murder is a partial defense okay because death has taken place so you are going to just lessen the punishment the punishment is not going to come to an end it's not going to be a complete zero punishment is going to be death but the punishment is going to be lesser than murder so culpable homicide not amounting to murder is a partial defense where a death takes place yes shada you are right um pankaj according to article 21 freedom life or personal liberty can be suicide no pankaj right to life does not include right to die okay because this point was clarified we have two cases p ratnam versus state and gyan kaur versus state of punjab ultimately we were given a clarification that right to live does not include right to die so that is why attempt to suicide is a forbidden act in our country when is death going to be culpable homicide not amounting to murder so again if we look at the probability factor the chances of survival are greater so when in the situation where b was unaware that uh, a has an ulcer in his stomach in that situation he obviously thought that a will survive okay sorry b will survive who had the stomach ulcer because he did not have that most important knowledge that is about the existence of the stomach stomach ulcer so they are saying the chances of survival are greater if not greater at least equal okay again the kind of weapon used so i'm going to again gently remind you that you have to see the kind of weapon used in combination with the body part that is being targeted so if you're going to hit someone with a stone on his head then your intention to murder is very clear right so do not uh, use this guideline as a straight jacket formula apply your common sense and use the two points that is body part targeted and the weapon used in combination and in this situation the death is likely rather than being probable so here the likelihood of death is not as much as we mentioned in the first point all right now uh, we come down to our next focus area offense against human body now these are the different type of offenses that we are going to be dealing with in the next uh, focus area and uh, i would want you to focus on this slide we are going to deal with these offenses in parts 
the first part is assault criminal force and hurt four of these offenses i'm going to deal in a chain because they are interrelated assault is the most minor offense that can be committed against a person's body and grievous hurt is the maximum kind of damage you can inflict on another person's body so from assault we are going to go to criminal force that is slightly higher in degree as far as damage is concerned from criminal force we are going to of course proceed to hurt and thereafter grievous hurt the next category is going to be wrongful restraint and wrongful confinement again they are similar type of offenses because the basic uh, point involved in both these offenses remains the same they both attack the personal liberty that is the freedom of movement of an individual and the last category i'm going to be dealing with under offenses against human body are kidnapping and abduction let's begin with the first one so i told you whenever you are reading you read assault you are going to read criminal force after that then you are going to move on to hurt and grievous hurt so we go high up in order as far as damage to a person's physique is concerned now what is assault the most important ingredient students about assault is that you don't actually create any physical contact with the person you want to attack here okay you simply create a fear or this apprehension in the mind of an individual that he is about to get attacked okay so one thing you are going to remember is that the accused is making a gesture or he is making a preparation okay which looks like that he is about to use a criminal force so if i pick up a stone and i do a gesture that i'm about to throw it at someone so that gesture is assault because it has created that fear in the mind of the other individual that i'm about to use force on him okay gesture of preparation and there has to be an intention okay now somebody who's just standing with a stone okay he is not his body language does not convey to you that he might attack attack you but you still get uh, scared then that does not come under the category of assault it should be very clear from the intention of the assaulter that he wants to create a fear in the mind of the other person if i have a ferocious dog and if i see another individual and i start unleashing my dog while looking at him now this is clear enough gesture or preparation that i am trying to create a fear in the mind of that individual so the bottom line is whenever you are going to create a fear in the mind of an individual that you are about to attack that person, Person, or the next step is going to be that you are he is going to be under attack and he is going to suffer some kind of physical loss or damage. Then that offence is known as assault. The next slide is telling you gesture or preparation should cause apprehension of criminal force. Now keep in mind criminal force is going to be the next offence that we are going to deal with. Look at this illustration. Robin shakes his fist at Sham intending or knowing it to be likely that he may thereby cause Sham to believe that Robin is about to strike Sham so this is a clear case of assault Robin is simply shaking his fist fist is drawing your hand in this position and he his body language clearly reflects that he is about to hit Sham now this body language this preparation of drawing your hand into a fist is clearly under the definition of assault the next offense is criminal force there must be an intentional use of force now i'm i told you that from assault we are going to go high up in order till we reach grievous hurt now the minute after creating that fear you establish a physical contact with the other individual okay and you establish that physical contact with a criminal intention and the second thing is you establish that physical contact without the permission of the other individual then it amounts to criminal force your physical contact has to amount to either fear injury or annoyance okay injury fear or annoyance if your physical contact is going to lead to injury injury may be hurt or grievous hurt or fear even if it makes you feel more fearful or it annoys you then that kind of physical contact comes under the category of criminal force look at this illustration ramesh intentionally pulls up a woman's veil okay 
now the fact that he is simply pulling up her veil that means she's covered her face or her head with say any kind of thin cloth in india dupattas are very popular or amongst the muslim communities the women are parda nasheen they cover themselves up all the time so even if somebody touches the veil or that burqa now you see physical contact has been established right so that might cause fear and annoyance in the individual so that physical contact is going to come under the category of criminal force okay now the next slide is telling you that if he does so without her consent we are still dealing with the problem which talks about the lifting of the veil and he knows that it is likely going to injure frighten or annoy her so his intention is there when he is establishing that physical contact it's not accidentally that he starts another woman's veil or her burqa but here he has the intention to either injure her or frighten her or annoy her so then this physical contact like i mentioned is going to come under the category of criminal force the next category is hurt all right so now we are going slightly higher up than criminal force criminal force said that if due to your physical contact you cause injury fear or annoyance now we are talking about that category of injury hurt so whenever your physical act causes to another person either bodily pain or disease or infirmity then you are said to have caused hurt to that person now bodily pain is clear disease is clear even the act of feeding somebody adulterated food comes under the category of hurt then infirmity infirmity means your incapability or your inability to carry out day to day jobs okay like brushing your teeth eating food bathing walking talking if you are incapable of doing this for any amount of time say for example somebody punched you in the arm and you could not move your arm for the entire day now he has uh caused infirmity or incapability in you to carry out your day to day functions with your arm this is going to come under the category of hurt and duration so for how long this bodily pain was caused or disease or infirmity was caused the duration or the time period is irrelevant now over sensitive pleas are not entertained by over sensitive pleas i mean somebody pricked a person with a needle that is over sensitive okay or if somebody uh, accidentally or in jest pulls a woman's hair now even though pulling somebody's uh, pulling a woman's hair comes under the category of outraging the modesty of woman but again we'll have to look at the element of intention but ideally if somebody's hair gets pulled by mistake or somebody gets pricked by a needle that's not going to come under the category of hurt uh, amandeep of course it is also dealt with under the food adulteration act but it also comes under the category of hurt okay it's an illustration that i'm giving you ma'am if uh, assault does not include physical uh, shivanshi it's something that we use in the uh, popular parlance physical assault okay so assault never involves a physical contact assault is only about creating this fear in the mind of that individual so physical assault is not a term we use legally in the legal parlance but physical assault is definitely used in the common parlance yes battery and criminal force are the same thing but dj battery is something that we deal with under law of torts it's a good thing that you've mentioned it here battery and criminal force are pretty much the same but criminal force is something that we deal with under ipc and battery is a tort okay the next category is grievous hurt now we are going higher step because after grievous hurt there can be homicides or the four homicides that we discussed now if you take uh, a look at this slide uh, it it's talking about emasculation permanent privation of the sight of either eye permanent privation of the hearing of either eye privation of a membrane or joint destruction or permanent impairing of the powers of any membrane or joint permanent disfiguration of the head or face fraction or dislocation of a bone now if you notice one thing in all the ingredients that i've read you don't need to learn these ingredients what i'm trying to bring out is all these uh, physical injuries are of a permanent nature even if you end up breaking somebody's permanent tooth that comes under the category of grievous hurt right now um yes sail can right of private defense be used against assault yes yes 
when you feel you are under threat and the next step can be any kind of physical injury sahil you can use your right of private defense okay because at that time it's your duty to ward off the dangerous situation dj you may not always be in the position to wait for the physical attack to happen so even if somebody is simply running towards you with a gun that is assault because he's created a fear in your mind so you can't actually wait for him to attack you or shoot in your direction so you can exercise your right of private defense so coming back here what we are looking at is the any kind of permanent damage okay throwing acid at another woman's face again it is permanent disfiguration of a face you permanently dislocate a bone you permanently break somebody's one of the limbs either of the limbs or you permanently damage somebody's capability of hearing or seeing or talking any kind of permanent damage is going to come under the category of grievous hurt what is important here is that any hurt during the space of 20 days now see whenever you are hurt that is bodily disease pain or infirmity if it only persists for less than 20 days okay then it's going to be hurt but the minute it increases or it goes beyond 20 days even those three things that is bodily pain disease or injury they are going to shift into the category of grievous hurt okay and uh, disability should be for 20 or more days Uh, and you should be unable to perform your ordinary or day to day jobs and dangerous injury of course we are going to talk about intention or knowledge in every offense we talk about because until and unless the intention or knowledge is not there you cannot make a person liable harris if a person comes to attack you and if you pull out a gun and seeing this he runs back no you should not shoot him because danger has been averted the dangerous situation has been avoided so if he's running back and if you still shoot him that means you're exceeding or misusing your right of private defense okay now we are done with that one category where we were discussing uh, hurt grievous hurt before that we started from assault we went on to criminal force that was higher up then hurt followed by grievous hurt now we are uh, going to deal with the next category that is wrongful restraint wrongful restraint and wrongful confinement like i told you they basically focus on a person's right of movement freedom of movement what you need to understand is wrongful restraint a uh, wrongful restraint is that situation where a person is not allowed to proceed in one direction so say for example there's a house and there is a public street right outside that house so the owner of that house says that the public street the portion of the public street that corresponds with my house i'm not going to allow you to pass from that portion so here you have the absolute legal right to be traveling on that public street but he is unlawfully stopping you from proceeding in that direction but in unlawful restraint what is really important is one direction is affected so he has the option to move around in any three directions he can always take a u turn and go forward in any other direction so the main difference between wrongful restraint and wrongful confinement is that wrongful restraint will stop you from moving only in one direction and you're going to see in the next slide that wrongful confinement is going to prevent you from moving in all four directions so uh, you know there can be a circumscribed limit and that circumscribed limit can be a room it can be a building it can be a farmhouse but you decide an outer limit and you say out of this limit you cannot proceed in any direction so wrongful restraint was in one direction wrongful confinement is in all four directions now let's look at this illustration at the bottom of the slide a places men with firearms at the outlets of a building and tells z that they will fire at z if z attempts to leave the building now in this case a has wrongfully confined z let me take a look at the queries a uh, man if the person is driving rashly under what section can he be arrested okay rash and negligent driving is a separate offense under ipc but if you uh, end up causing the death of an individual due to a rash and negligent act then that's going to be covered under section 304a if the assault which is uh, going to be done 
is not so intense but in private defense i hit him intensely see surbhi when a person is going to attack you you can't be completely sure about his intentions you can't be sure that he is not going to physically injure you or he is not going to you know uh, damage you he is not going to cause you any kind of hurt so uh, at that time you just need to prove that the person's actions the kind of weapons he had they made you believe that your life was under threat so you responded in a certain manner you just have to prove in court that your exercise of private defense or the use of force on your uh, as far as you are concerned was proportionate to the attack Uh, ma'am if a contract involves wrongful restraint to which we consent are we bound to abide by the contract harris if you have uh, undertaken this then you have to abide by it because there are three situations which the law clearly prohibits okay first is agreements in restraint of marriage agreements in restraint of legal proceedings and agreements in restraint of trade other than that if you've consented to something until and unless you consented to it due to threat or undue influence uh, if that's not the case you have to be bound by the contract and also i am going to be taking up a contract in the next e lecture so we'll be clarifying all of that much more no anshuman the section numbers are not important at all yes purnima if he is simply driving rashly but hasn't harmed anyone purnima rash and negligent driving is an offense in any case even if you don't harm anyone that is why if you are over speeding you get a chalan right you know that so you may not necessarily harm anyone but over speeding is still a rash and negligent act right all right um the next section is uh, sorry the next offense against human body is kidnapping now uh, kidnapping has a lot to do please focus on this kidnapping has a lot to do with the age okay now abduction is used for adults and kidnapping the word is used for minors minors and majors but as far as kidnapping is concerned the girl has to be below 18 and the boy has to be below 16 so if a girl is 18 and below then if even if she goes with someone with her own consent it is still going to be kidnapping because she is not allowed to do so without the permission of her parents or her guardian and the second situation is the boy if he is below 16 or is 16 then again even if he goes with someone with his own consent it will still be kidnapping because his consent has no value it holds zero value until and unless the boy is above 16 and the girl is above 18 so a lot of instances where you know a girl elopes with a boy runs away with the boy what the parents of the girl do they file charges of kidnapping against the boy because the girl legally is incapable of giving a consent uh anshuman uh, we are going to uh, yes only when you are above 18 in case of a girl and you are above 16 like i mentioned then it is abduction otherwise it's going to be kidnapping or any person of unsound mind so a person who's un- who has an unsound mind is not capable of giving a consent then a girl who's below 18 or a boy who's below 16 when they go with someone without the permission of parents or guardians it is always going to be kidnapping so in the question paper if the paper setter tries to confuse you by saying that the girl went away with her own consent please do not fall for this trap it's a tricky situation and they you need to stick to your uh, laws here you need to keep this in mind that if the girl is below 16 and the boy is below 18 irrespective of their consent it is still going to amount to the offense of kidnapping yes so mirren human trafficking will be taking it up human trafficking of course involves the element of either abduction or kidnapping okay depending on the age and that group of juvenile act it comes under this uh no it does not act of child is something that a child does okay who is below 18 years of age and we discuss those age groups right so that does not come with, come under this okay this is here where we are kidnapping a child okay this is a different situation an act of child was where a child commits a crime then how is the law going to deal with the child abduction like i told you the main uh, 
point of difference is the age so if the boy is above 16 and if the girl is above 18 then of course the consent of their parents or their guardians is not relevant so if you are going to either forcibly take a boy who's above 16 and a girl who's above 18 or you're going to cheat that person into going from one location to the other then it's going to amount to abduction okay so this is the main difference now with this we come an end to the uh, second last focus area for this e-lecture that is offenses against human body. Now I'm going to quickly take up the last focus area and uh, we'll wind it up and then we are going to take up your queries. Now what are the offenses that you can commit against the human property? These are the four offenses that we are going to primarily deal with because there's a heavy focus on these four offenses in the CLAD, ALIT or SCT papers, theft, extortion, robbery and decoity. Now if you get into the definitions of these offenses, they are technical, they are heavily worded. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm going to give you some conceptual clarity. So just stay with me, keep your focus alive for a few more minutes. Sahil abduction only involves boys who are above 16 and girls who are above 18. Tiksha, don't worry. I'm going to tell you briefly again that if there is a boy who's above 18 and a girl, sorry, if a boy is above 16 and the girl is above 18, then it's always going to be abduction because you have to consent ka question. Hi nahi hai. Okay? Alright. So I'm going to move forward with theft. Now, dishonest intention has to be there to take away another person's property okay we all understand what stealing is or what theft is now what is really important is when you take it out of the possession of another person now please understand i'm talking about lawful possession i'm not using the word ownership the word i'm using here is lawful possession the next point is saying without the consent of the person in possession now understand one thing that say for example there is a car which is registered on the name of your mother or your father but you are using that car okay so the owners are one of your parents but who who is the lawful possessor of that car you are the lawful possessor of that car or say for example when you give away your own clothes for dry cleaning you are the owner of those clothes but when you go to the dry cleaner shop and you bring back those clothes without paying him money for the dry cleaning now you gave the clothes in his lawful possession so even if you yourself bring back your own clothes, it will still be theft or stealing because the key ingredient is dishonest intention and taking out the movable property from the lawful possession. Of course, common sense tells us that theft can only be committed as far as movable property is concerned. You can't move immovable property. Okay, then there has to be some removal of property. So it's not relevant that I have to pick up, say, for example, a gold chain and take it to a different city or take it to a different building. Even if I share my locker with a colleague and I take out cash from his locker and put it in my locker, which is right next to my colleague's locker, it is still going to amount to the offense of theft. Uh, okay, now can trees be stolen? Trees are going to be immovable property, but the minute you cut off a branch, okay, the minute you cut off a branch, that cut off branch becomes movable property, and if that is removed, it is going to amount to theft. For that matter, crops, okay, trees are immovable property, but crops that are grown in fields, they are movable property, okay. Yes, uh, timber trees are going to amount to movable property only after they are cut, okay? According to Transfer of Property Act, so Transfer of Property Act uh, uh, only covers basically the contracts which are undertaken for the selling or purchase or dealing uh, or any kind of dealing of movable property. Sale of Goods Act is a species of the Indian Contract Act and it is specifically dealing with the buying and selling of movable goods. So as far as their uh, theft is concerned, it is going to be dealt with with IPC only. Alright. Illustration. Now Roshni finds a ring belonging to Zenith on a table in the house which Zenith occupies. Here the ring is in Zenith's possession and if Roshni dishonestly removes it, Roshni's 
has committed the offense of theft okay harris if uh, we just cut down a tree from a person's property but do not take it away it will be attempt to theft it will not be theft because harris section 511 of the ipc says that if you attempt to carry out any of those acts which have been called crimes or offenses under the ipc it will be attempt okay because if he is not able to take away the tree that has been cut down it is still be attempt say for example there is a pickpocket he puts his hand into another person's pocket and the other person's pocket is empty so he has still attempted theft right pankaj conversion is that scenario where one person gives you a certain amount of movable property okay with his own will or with his own consent say for example there is a marriage uh, party going on and a individual uh, somebody who's a friend or a relatives says that please take care of my gold chain i might lose it now he or she has given it to you with his own consent your initial um, intention was honest later on there's a change of intent intention and you might convert that chain into money okay so here conversion is really important we use this element conversion under the criminal misappropriation of property where you convert the mode of property from one form to the other so from gold chain to money so this is the element of conversion if police catches you cutting a tree again it's going to be attempt to theft and it's also covered under several environmental laws okay the next point is theft and possession i've already explained it to you that what is really relevant is in whose uh, possession lawful possession is that movable property at that point of time so you may be the owner and you may have given it into somebody's lawful possession so if you need to take it back from that person's lawful possession again you have to take that person's permission like i gave you that example of you going and giving your clothes to a dry cleaner and later on bringing back those clothes without paying him money or without his consent so even though you own the uh, clothes you are still going to be a thief no the punishment for attempt is always lesser than the actual offense there is only one offense under ipc which is dacoity and for dacoity the uh, the punishment for attempt is same and the punishment for completing the offense of dacoity will also be the same okay robbery now robbery as the slide tells us has all the elements of theft so we've discussed that what are the elements of theft you have to have a dishonest intention there has to be removal of property and the subject matter has to be movable but while carrying out theft if you do the following that means you cause the death of an individual you cause hurt or you cause wrongful restraint wrongful restraint is when you stop the person from proceeding in a certain direction or you cause the fear of death hurt or wrongful restraint right then it is going to amount to robbery so if you have to convert theft to robbery it has to be accompanied either by causing a fear of death hurt or wrongful restraint or you straight away cause either of the three death hurt or wrongful restraint okay illustration venkat meets sumit shows a pistol and demands sumit's purse sumit in consequence surrenders his purse here venkat has extorted the purse from sumit by putting him in fear of instant hurt so what's relevant here is instant hurt either hurt or i've told you wrongful restraint or death if theft is accompanied by these three elements then its theft gets converted into robbery all right now theft robbery and dacoity i am going to interrelate the three for you i have told you the elements of theft i have told you how if theft is accompanied by either death hurt or wrongful restraint or simply creating a fear of either of these three it becomes robbery so let me explain this for you theft when you are going to add these three elements to theft it becomes robbery and when robbery is committed by five or more people then it becomes dacoity as simple as that so this is how you are going to relate the three theft robbery and dacoity yes aditya extortion the element of extortion is also there anshuman if a man of unsound 
30 years old will be abducted or kidnapped see in this case uh, when i was discussing the offense of kidnapping i told you the three categories a girl who's below 18 a boy who's below 16 and a person who has an unsound mind so if a person irrespective of his age because he's incapable of giving his own consent no matter how old it is it is always going to be the offense of kidnapping because see somebody who is unsound he's always going to be under somebody's guardianship okay so with this i have tried to cover up most of uh, the relevant areas under ipc now i am throwing open the dais for your queries uh, the punishment for decoity is not rigorous okay it's just uh, when ipc was framed in 1860 decoity was a very very popular offense okay trains were looted caravans were looted people would travel on foot or on bullock carts we're talking about 1860 decoits uh, the word daku came from decoity or decoits alright so the discouragement had to be huge so even if you were just attempting it even if it was a failed attempt at decoity the punishment was as good as a successful attempt of decoity uh, relationship between theft and hurt uh, Diksha uh, ideally you might cause if you end up hurting someone while say for example you punch somebody in the stomach or in the face and you take away his wallet okay then here you are converting theft into robbery okay so they are interrelated in the sense that if you add this additional element of hurt to theft it's going to become robbery uh, Shraddha the difference between robbery and decoity is very simple whenever robbery is carried out by five or more people it becomes decoity so the key uh, point of difference is the number of people who are involved in robbery no Pankaj punishments will not be asked uh, Shivansh, what is really relevant about extortion is that uh, when you're ex uh, extor extortion is an offense for which you don't have to be physically present over there. You can threaten a person, you know how extortion calls are made, right? So you don't have to be physically present over there. And then you ask the person to come over and hand you over a certain amount of money. In theft, robbery or decoity, you forcibly go and you uh, try to bring back some kind of movable property. In it. But in extortion, you simply threaten the person. It may be face to face or an underworld dawn might be sitting in Dubai and might be making an extortion call. Okay, so that is the difference. Physical presence of the accused is not required. And the victim himself goes and gives the movable property to the extortionist but in theft or robbery or decoity the robber or the thief or the decoit goes himself and forcibly brings back any kind of movable property money gold etc uh shadha the difference between theft and robbery is that when you're carrying out theft is you simply go and you pick up a uh, pick up somebody's money okay which is lying in his drawer and it would become robbery if you threaten him that I am going to hurt you or I am not going to let you leave this room or I am going to kill you if you don't hand over the money to me. Anshuman, in extortion when we say there's delivery of goods that means that when you threaten someone over the phone that look I want you to make sure that you bring 50 lakh rupees tomorrow or you deposit 50 lakh rupees in my account tomorrow. So here the person himself is going to go to the bank and is going to transfer a certain amount of money in another person's account. So here the extortionist has not done anything himself. He simply made a threatening call. But in theft, you go yourself and you remove the property. So theft would be going into somebody's house and taking out 50 lakh on your own. Uh, Harris uh, embezzlement involves a very key factor which is criminal breach of trust. So embezzlement is when you are entrusted with some kind of movable property. It could be money, it could be documents and it is usually when you hold a certain kind of position in an organization. So say for example an accountant is supposed to be in charge of all the money that is being earned by the organization. So if he uh, deals with that money fraudulently if he starts depositing a small share amount of that money in his uh, account every day okay so that is going to amount to criminal breach of trust right so embezzlement we uh, usually use this word in terms of money sahil tomorrow the next e lecture that you have in the same time slot is going to be on the law of contracts
Anshuman, I just, uh, I just explained criminal breach of trust that whenever you are made in charge of any kind of immovable property and you do not deal with it in the way you are supposed to deal with it say for example you are appointed as the caretaker of a guest house or you are appointed as the caretaker of a certain private or government property and you start renting out that property to someone you are not allowed to do that in your official capacity so here there is a criminal breach of trust uh, so, Miran, stalking is in itself a separate offence now. After the Amendment Act of 2013, several new offences have been added like stalking, acid attack, attempt to acid attack, sexual harassment, voyeurism. So, stalking is a different offence altogether as far as uh, IPC is concerned now. Yeah, Dikshant, you are right because he was entrusted with the money. Okay? So, he misused that money. So, Dikshant has given us a nice example. Purnima, uh, which chai example are you talking about? I can't recollect it. The chain example I gave is not criminal breach of trust because I told you that the person eventually sold the chain and converted it, converted it into money. So, the element of conversion was there, right? So, had she just kept the chain with her, then it would have been detinue under torts and also, of course, criminal breach of trust. But because she converted it into another form, then it is conversion. Because whenever you, uh, whenever you deal with the... Uh, the movable property with a malified intention and you also change its form say for example you convert the money into gold or vice versa then it is going to be criminal breach of trust uh, Pankaj, uh, what questions do you want me to discuss? Zenith, uh, wrongful restraint is when you do not allow a person to proceed in one direction which he has a right to proceed in. That is why I gave you the example that if somebody stops you from going in one direction on a public street but the other three directions are open to you, it's going to be wrongful restraint. Pankaj, which MCQs you want me to discuss sample questions? See, we are really pressed for time, so I've tried to give you as much conceptual clarity that was possible, okay? Conceptually, you need to be absolutely clear. So, uh, my uh, suggestion to you is try to uh, get these concepts in your head, try to make sure you understand them well, attempt questions, and then I'll, do, I'll try to take up as many MCQs in the query section, okay? In the following lectures. So, I hope... Uh, Today's lecture was beneficial to you and I've already mentioned that in the next lecture I'm going to be taking up the most important topics and subtopics under the law of contract. But um, if you have any doubts that are pending even from this lecture, you're most welcome to post them in the next lecture that's going to happen in the same time slot tomorrow. So thank you so much for your time and attention and um, just stay very geared up because at this point your attitude is going to make all the difference. So this is going to be your make your break moment or your make your break days. So stay very very focused and I'll see you in the next session. Thank you very much.